This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Heart and Vascular Grand Rounds. Uh, this morning, uh, our speaker <clears throat> essentially needs no introduction to this group for sure. Our shed is uh, is has uh, has a experience and uh, success in translational and clinical research that is really hard to find a parallel for. As many of you know, his his contributions have included uh, some of the really early and seminal discussions on endothelial dysfunction, role of the angiotensin system in the vasculature. Uh, his work has also been in biomarkers, with most recently with SUPAR, but and also a combination of markers that are very helpful in predicting uh, cardiovascular disease. And today, I think he's going to talk to us, looks like, about stem cells and cardiovascular diseases. Seems like he has a uh, newly funded NIH clinical trial uh, that he'll probably somehow weave into this and looking for some participants as well. Uh, but uh, here's what's new from Marshad. Welcome, Marshad. Good morning, everyone. You can come and sit in the front. I don't bite. Um, the uh, so I, I don't think at this meeting, I've talked about this in a few years, so I thought I'd bring you up to date with the work that's been going on uh, at Emory regarding uh, stem cells and progenitor cells. And uh, it's not about clinical trials, although I'll get to that towards the end. Um, so what I'm going to do is to talk about progenitor cells and stem cells, um, largely things that we can measure in, in man and going to cover these topics over the next 45 minutes or so. So as you know, um, and we've talked about this before several times, the uh, last 20 years or more, we've understood that there are circulating stem and progenitor cells, particularly of the endothelial origin. The bone marrow is thought to be a repository of stem cells, very pluripotent stem cells that can be um, then divide into um, mesodermal, ectodermal, endodermal, origin so that they get lineage specific. And it's the mesodermal uh, progenitors that we are most interested in because these are the ones that lead to hematopoietic stem cells and blood cells that we are so familiar with. But also a small number of those will be endothelial progenitor cells. And of course, the mesodermal progenitors will also produce stromal or mesenchymal stem cells, which are the cells that will ultimately lead to uh, production of mesenchymal organs, including skeletal and cardiac muscle that we are interested in. So um, these cells exist, they exist in the bone marrow, but they also exist in, um, in tissues themselves. Um, and this is why tissues, all tissues, have the ability to regenerate and repair. And to study this system, we have recognized, and this is initially work done by Asahara and his colleagues, that the Peripheral blood has circulating stem cells and progenitor cells that can be measured by using some special techniques. And the reason we are now interested in all of this, and I want to spend all this time telling you about this, is because of, of what this one of the last slides shows, and that is that the, our capacity to have these cells, and we're counting these cells in this particular assay as CD34 cells, if you have high numbers of these cells and you have coronary artery disease, you have better survival, almost two and a half fold better survival than if you've run out of these cells um, in the circulation and in the bone marrow. In, and the bone marrow. So indicating that the reduction in these stem cells or progenitor cells, what we would consider as endogenous reparative or regenerative capacity, leads to increased mortality after adjustment for every other risk factor that you can think of that is prognostic in this population. So how do we measure these? There are many assays that are out there. Um, these are very rare cells. So among the circulating mononuclear cells, one in 1,000, one in 10,000 would potentially be an endothelial progenitor cell. So how do you find these rare cells in the circulation? Well, initially, uh, culture assays were developed, uh, particularly using endothelial-specific media that allowed the cells to grow over days and weeks. And then several assays were developed um, and, um, and we initially thought that some of these colonies that were formed uh, actually represent endothelial progenitor cell colony forming units, but it turns out that they are very mixed colonies that I'll show you in a second. Uh, 
And the other way to do that is using fax analysis, fax analysis where you just measure the numbers of these cells in the circulation that acts as a very nice or easy surrogate uh, to measure this in large populations. So in the early years, um, we, uh, as I said, did these colony forming unit assays. Um, Creton had just come on faculty when he did this in Bob Taylor's lab. And, um, and these colonies, if you study them carefully and see what these cells are expressing, you realize that they, there are a lot of uh, leukocyte antigens that are expressed, T cell antigens, and also endothelial um, uh, characteristics in these cells. So it's a mixed colony um, with uh, leukocytes, T cells, uh, inflammatory cells, as well as endothelial progenitor cells. And the expression levels was m were measured. And notice that a lot of them express angiogenesis-related peptides uh, and, and genes, uh, VEGF, chemokines, MMPs, and endothelial-specific genes. And you see a whole list of these, suggesting that once again, these population of cells that are within these colonies, that are outgrowth colonies, take seven days in an endothelial-specific uh, assay to measure, yield um, these kinds of cells. and. Uh, and when uh, this was measured in a few people who had bone marrow transplant with sex mismatch uh, bone marrow, uh, then these colonies express the, um, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, chromosome that was from the bone marrow, in other words, the sex mismatch, suggesting that these colonies are formed from cells that originate in the bone marrow and not from the peripheral uh, cells. So these colonies' uh, cells express increased levels of pro-angiogenic growth factors, and they form tubes if you put them in matrigel. So they had the ability to proliferate and form, as it were, new blood vessels. Um, they were certainly a bone marrow origin, and they had this paracrine angiogenic activity. And there were further studies done by other groups that looked at genetic predisposition to form more or less of these uh, cells, and, uh, and there are some good papers that are reviewed in this article, which I won't have time to go into. So as I said before, with the help of um, Ned Waller's lab, who has a fax score here, uh, we have now set up uh, a way of measuring circulating levels of these progenitor cells, and they are done by estimating and counting the number of CD34 expressing cells, which are thought to be enriched for hematopoietic stem cells. When they, these cells co-express 133 antigen, then they're thought to be early cells, and when they express VEGF receptors, they're thought to be enriched for endothelial cells, and when they express CXCR4, and we'll come back to this later as well, this is the uh, receptor that's found on these progenitor cells that allows them to home to areas of ischemia. So um, the, we can measure all of these um, in these mononuclear cells that are um, uh, faxed, as it were, using fax analyses assay. Uh, and this is just shown here of how this is done. You, you gate for mononuclear cells and then for CD34 cells and then for VEGF and other receptors. So you get fewer and fewer cells as you get to the VEGF-positive cell populations. So circulating stem cells or progenital cells can be measured, and their activity and numbers reflect intrinsic regenerative or reparative capacity. So if we do this in large numbers of individuals, what did we find? So what is the influence of age and cardiovascular risk factors on circulating progenitors? So we've done this now in thousands of individuals, as is shown in this study. This was um, authored by Ibhar. Um, notice how there is a decrease in general in these thousands of dots that you see of these individuals represented here uh, as we age, such that by the age of 80 plus, you have approximately half the number of circulating CD34 cell types um, compared to when um, you're about 20 years of age. So there is this gradual reduction in circulating progenitors in the overall population mixed with people who were healthy, had risk factors, or who had cardiovascular disease. Now, when we separated this population into those who were completely healthy versus those who had risk factors and those who had cardiovascular disease, then this is what we found. The green line 
here represents what happened with aging in people who were otherwise healthy and were not exposed to any cardiovascular risk factors. So if you age very healthily, there is really very gradual or no decline in circulating progenitors, at least to the age of 60 plus, we didn't have very many risk factor free people beyond this age. However, if you are exposed to risk factors, one or two cardiovascular risk factors shown in the brown line or multiple risk factors plus cardiovascular disease shown in this uh, uh, the brown line, then you notice that, um, that there is a much more steeper decline with aging uh, as you age unhealthily, if you like. So there is a difference with what happens to stem cells and progenitor cells as we age, and it is based uh, somewhat on uh, the exposure to risk factors. So here, if you looked at the overall population and, and divided now people into those who were otherwise healthy and those who had one or two risk factors or those who had multiple risk factors or cardiovascular disease, there's clearly a significant reduction in the CD34 cells in the circulation in this population. When we divided this population to those who were older than 55, notice that this difference existed and was pretty prominent and significant but not when we looked at the younger populations. Um, so younger here is defined less than 55, which uh, at least for people in the back might still be very old. Uh, but um, this, uh, this group didn't have this. So what this suggests is that this kind of um, interaction between age and exposure to risk factors and what happens to uh, circulating stem cells and to our bone marrow and its reparative capacity uh, is, is complex such that when you age, the progenitor cell counts are older as we age and then we age unhealthily, but at a younger age, this difference is not so obvious. And we'll come back to that. And there is much more about this in this paper that was recently published, if you're interested. So the question is, is this just an aging phenomenon? You know, is this just like everything ages and these cells also go down in number? One of the ways we measure biological aging is by measuring leukocyte telomere length. So uh, at the end of our chromosome, there are these repeat nucleotides. Uh, there are thousands of these. And so there is a certain length to this telomere, as it's called. And as the cell divides and replicates, and you would do more of this if you're damaging the system, whichever cell type you're talking about, the more replications there are, the telomere gets shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, so that it's, a, it's an expression, it's a measure, if you like, of biological aging of cells independent of your chronological aging. And this occurs not just with time, this shortening of telomere length, but it can be accelerated by exposure to toxins and oxidation and inflammation, et cetera, et cetera. And if you look at vast numbers of normal population and measure the telomere length and regress it with age, you realize that there is this decline, very gradual decline, but a huge heterogeneity in the reduction in telomere length with aging, um, because it is underlying aging phenomenon. And then if you look at prognosis of individuals, this is looking at mortality with respect to telomere length, then you realize that if you're in the top 10th percentile of reduced telomere length, you have almost a 40% increased risk compared to the bottom 10th percentile of the longest telomere length. So they, if this is one, this is 1.4 fold increased risk uh, in the general population. So there's an independent measure, independent of age, a measure of uh, cardiovascular risk or mortality, uh, biological aging. So in this study, Mohammed Hamada in the MIPS trial looked at individuals who had stable coronary artery disease and measured telomere length as well as circulating progenitor cell levels and found that the telomere length was an independent predictor of the uh, progenitor cell count, even after adjusting for age and risk factors. So one of the reasons why we run out of these cells is because of this biological aging that we are undergoing. So for each 10% lowering of the telomere length, the CD34 count also fell by 5% independent of all the other risk factors. So biological aging is associated with redu reduction in our regenerative capacity as well, it seems. And we'll come back to this later on. And this is published recently, if you are interested. What are the other factors that determine uh, the frequency of these cells and our regenerative capacity? So we looked at race, 
and sex and influence of weight and other risk factors that I showed you earlier. So in this study, the uh, gender analysis done by Matt Topol here, 642 healthy subjects without any risk factors, or or without any cardiovascular disease. Um, generally what we found was no matter which cell type you looked at, these are various CD34 cell types which are hematopoietic enriched progenitors if you like. Um, and, uh, and then we also looked at the VEGF positive cells. All of these hematopoietic uh, progenitor cell populations were about 20% lower in women compared to men. And in women, there was a weak correlation between estradiol levels um, and progenitor cell counts, so that higher levels were associated with slightly higher counts and lower levels with lower. So postmenopausal women generally had fewer uh, progenitor cells than premenopausal women. And if you looked at this with age, so this is age, this is blue is men uh, with their confidence intervals, and this is women. Notice that there is a decline in both the men and women with aging. Uh, and there is a difference throughout the ages, perhaps slightly lower as we get older. Um, and this has recently been published as well, if you're interested in getting more details. In addition to that, the, uh, um, the uh, gender differences, we looked at racial differences. This is work that is being done by Eamon and Pratik is also looking at the influence of weight on these cells and notice that in a multivariate analysis where you put all the differences between individuals in, then if you just looked at the CD34 count, 17% lower cell count in blacks compared to whites, independent of all the other risk factors. And as weight goes up, the cell count goes up, both independent predictors. Um, so here's um, black-white differences, blacks in yellow, and notice that even without any risk factors, blacks had lower cell counts. And again, these are adjusted and uh, one to two risk factors, perhaps a little attenuation of the difference between blacks and whites when you come to high risk individuals. Similarly, as weight goes up, progenitor cell counts go up gradually, still more, much heterogeneity, but it seems to be an independent predictor of increase in uh, circulating progenitors. So is there a circadian variation? So this study was done by Ibhar some years ago um, in healthy subjects who had six measurements of progenitor cells done throughout a 24-hour period, starting at 8 a.m. at noon, 4 p.m., 8 p.m. Then he slept in the GCRC, midnight, 4 a.m. and 8 a.m. again. And uh, measured not only the blood uh, for these cells, but also measured vascular function. So they had endothelial function testing and arterial stiffness testing, including at these times. And basically, this is the um, sort of a um, difference that was seen. Progenitor cell counts were lowest at, in the morning hours, and they were highest in the evening hours. Uh, significantly different. And then if you looked at uh, how the uh, morning, this is 8 a.m., this is 8 p.m., uh, notice how progenitor cell levels were highest in the evening hours, lowest in the morning hours. And at that morning hours, again, arterial stiffness measured as augmentation index here was highest, and FMD, which is a measure of endothelial function, was lowest at that time. Remember, this is the vulnerable time. This is where myocardial infarctions are higher, ischemia is higher. There's a circadian variation in most things in life, including cardiovascular syndromes. And, and also the subclinical measures of vascular function, like stiffness and endothelial function. And long behold, uh, progenitor cell levels also cycle along the same clock. And this has been re recently published in this paper. So, What's the relationship then between these subclinical vascular measures, subclinical vascular disease, and, and our uh, regenerative capacity or the circulating stem cells? So this, this was done using a colony forming assay that I mentioned earlier in the old days, where we looked at Framingham risk score and colony forming units, uh, which actually are not endothelial necessarily, they're mixed angiogenic colony forming units. Notice that people who had high Framingham risk score high risk, had lower cell counts than those who had low risk. And we looked at senescent measures uh, using this beta-gal assay. People who had high risk had uh, their more uh, senescence, if you like, even in their progenitor cell colony forming units. 
And then we looked at endothelial function using flow-mediated vasodilation technique measurement. Then there was a neat relationship between these uh, circulating endothelial cell colonies, if you like, and uh, endothelial function so that if you looked at it in tertiles, individuals who had the best function had the largest numbers of these uh, colonies compared to those, almost a threefold difference. And these colonies were an independent measure of, um, of endothelial function, even after adjustment for risk factors, and this was published at, uh, a long time ago. Since then, we have uh, uh, looked at relationships between the circulating progenitors measured by fax analysis. This is just showing you CD34 assay. Uh, there's a relationship between IMT and this, such that people who had high IMT have lower numbers of cells than those who had lower IMT. When we measured vascular function as microvascular function using PAT, um, this sort of um, reactive hyperemia index that's measuring vasodilator capacity in the fingertip, um, there is a relationship such that people who had less microvascular reactivity had less cells. And then we measured arterial stiffness. Here's showing you data with respect to um, endothelial um, enriched progenitors. There's an inverse relationship such that people who had fewer cells had uh, higher stiffness measures. So what about ischemia? How does ischemia influence um, progenitor cells and uh, whether it's transient or whether it's uh, profound ischemia such as in myocardial infarction? So the ischemia studies have been uh, recently published by uh, Mohammed. Uh, we looked at individuals who had coronary artery disease who were enrolled into the MIPS study. They underwent exercise testing to look for myocardial ischemia. Uh, about a third of them had ischemia during stress testing. We also measured their circulating progenitor cell levels at baseline and after exercise, about 90 minutes after exercise. And this is what uh, happens. Those individuals who had ischemia, shown in red, they actually had reduction in the circulating numbers of their progenitor cells, which was significantly different response to individuals who were exercising but did not develop ischemia, who had a slight increase. So ischemia-positive patients had an 18% decrease, particularly in this cell type, the CXCR4 expressing. Remember, this is the receptor that allows these cells to home to areas of ischemia. And that decrease in progenitor cells in this population who are ischemia positive correlated inversely with the severity of ischemia, uh, such that people who had more ischemia had greater lowering of the circulating progenitors with, after exercise. However, ischemia negative patients had an increase in their cell counts. So normal response to exercise, if you're not going to develop ischemia, is for the cell count to increase. So transient ischemia is associated with transient reduction in the circulating levels of our progenitors. So what's going on? What's the mechanism of this? So to understand that, you have to understand what um, uh, SDF does. So we looked at a couple of um, uh, cytokines that are responsible for mobilizing of stem cells, et cetera. One of them is VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, that's also released during exercise. And although everybody who exercised had an increase in VEGF levels, and perhaps this was responsible for the mobilization of progenitors with exercise, there was really no relationship between the change and VEGF levels, but there was with SDF1 levels. So SDF, or stromal derived factor one, is also called CXCL12. So this is the ligand for CXCR4. So this is the receptor that the progenitor cells have that allows them to home to areas of ischemia. The areas of ischemia uh, or hypoxia, whatever that might be, in this case, it will be the heart when it's going, undergoing this ischemic injury during treadmill exercise. So this, this ischemic tissue will then express HIF-1, which will then express CXCL12 or SDF, and that will allow these cells to home to the areas of ischemia in that myocardium. So that's what's going on. So the change in SDF1 level in this study correlated with the change in, uh, in the uh, progenitor cell level in the circulation, such that people who had greater SDF1 level had, um, had a greater uh, reduction in their progenitor cell count because the, we believe that these cells then homed to areas of ischemia. Now, in this study, we didn't label the cells and image them 
to see that they went to areas of ischemia, but these experiments have been done both in animals as well as in patients with myocardial infarction to show that that is exactly what happens uh, to these progenitors when they are given. So exercise mobilizes progenitor cells from the bone marrow, perhaps due to VEGF, and exercise-induced ischemia leads to homing of these, particularly the CXCR4 positive progenitors, likely due to binding to SDF1 alpha that's expressed in the ischemic myocardium. So the implication of that is that this is a kind of a homeostatic uh, mechanism that we have so that when you become ischemic, you have these cells mobilizing from the bone marrow that they're home to areas of ischemia and that's where you get the angiogenesis effects over time, presumably collateral de development occurs uh, if that is necessary. And, and there are, there's data to suggest that there is this direct relationship between the health of the progenitor cell system and the development of collaterals in the event of coronary injury. And that cell therapy with CD34 cells we've known uh, from some phase one, phase two studies can lead to improvement in post ischemic myocardial injury. So this paper is just about to come out in JAHA as well. Um, other studies have looked at uh, people who have um, a myocardial ischemia, presumably with, uh, with normal coronary arteries. So this is uh, the WISE CVD study um, done in uh, Florida and the West Coast in Cedars, where 160 women were enrolled who had a positive stress test, but they had non-obstructive coronary artery disease. And one of the ways we define uh, ischemic um, propensity in these individuals is to look at coronary flow reserve. And there was this inverse relationship we found between coronary flow reserve and the CD34 cell population. So that low coronary flow reserve with adenosine correlated with significantly higher levels of uh, progenitor cells. So suggesting once again that, <clears throat> um, that if you look at this in people who had CFR less than two, if you count that as well, they had almost 50% more cells than people who had normal CFR above 2.5 on average, significant difference in the hematopoietic progenitors. So there is stimulation, if you like, uh, due to perhaps this microvascular injury that these people are sustaining and during the normal daily activities of their circulating progenitor cells. Now, what about um, uh, in acute myocardial infarction, much bigger injury, situation. So this has been now looked at in you know, more than 2,000 people who some of them had acute MI, others had unstable angina admissions, and others were stable. And here's the difference between them. Notice that the acute MI people had a significantly higher levels of circulating progenitor cells compared to the stable MI or the unstable angina individuals. Um, after adjustment for all these risk factors and so on, acute MI was associated with uh, quite substantial increase, 19, 25, 27% in various hematopoietic progenitor cell enriched populations, and even in the endothelial enriched populations, more than doubling of the VEGF positive population in this, in this group. So the question is, is this due to the size of the MI, or is it due to something to do with your bone marrow and how much it has in reserve? When uh, troponin levels were correlated with uh, mobilization of these stem cells, there was no relationship. This is one way of measuring size of MI, if you like. But in, a, in another study where we were doing bone marrow aspirations in individuals with ST elevation MI as part of the PRESERVE trial, we also looked at bone marrow uh, progenitors, these progenitors in the bone marrow and also in the peripheral blood simultaneously. And, and basically, there's a very strong relationship between peripheral blood CD34 count and bone marrow CD34 populations and all the other populations that we looked at, suggesting then that uh, circulating progenitor cell counts actually reflect what's happening in the bone marrow to uh, progenitor cells as well. And, um, and then the next question is, so you notice how these cell counts in the periphery are far lower, almost 34 lower than they are in the bone marrow. So the bone marrow has many, many more cells than what we see in the periphery, but there is a one-to-one -one relationship almost uh, between what gets mobilized given um, stimuli such as acute MI. So what's the significance of who cares? You know, okay, this is what happens, nice to know, but does it really matter? So these patients with acute coronary syndrome were followed for two years and 12.5% of them died. And notice that the cell count the progenitor cell count was an independent predictor of outcomes so that people who had high cell counts, 
in the setting of an acute MI fared much better uh, than com compared to people in, who, had, uh, who were in the lower two tertiles of these cell counts. Even after adjustment for all of these things, two and a half fold increased risk based on your progenitor cell count uh, after MI. What about other coronary syndromes or non-coronary syndromes like heart failure, peripheral arterial disease, and so on? So in this study, Amen has looked at um, 2,000 individuals. About a quarter of them had heart failure diagnosis. Two-thirds of them had HEFREF, and the others had HEFPEF. And notice that the presence of heart failure was associated with reduction in all progenitor cell counts in the circulation, such that the hematopoietic-enriched cells, as well as the endothelial-enriched populations, were significantly lower. But it really didn't matter whether you had a HEFPEF or HEFREF. There was really no difference between these groups. So patients with heart failure have lower levels of circulating progenitors, uh, both of endothelial and hematopoietic um, origin. Then we looked at more detailed um, way uh, as to what was determining this reduction by looking at how we measure heart failure, greater, greater reduction with uh, greater functional class. So you notice that uh, people with functional class four, for example, had a dramatically lower, um, uh, these are endothelial and rich cell counts that are shown here. And these are the hematopoietic cells. And notice that the uh, left atrial size was inversely associated as well. Uh, again, an expression of um, dilatation or LA pressures. PA pressures were correlated. BNP levels were vaguely correlated uh, with, with cell counts as well. So severity of heart failure, the more severe you have, uh, the more likely you are to have depression of uh, the uh, stem cell system. So what is the significance of all of this? Is this just a reflection of the severity of heart failure? Well, once again, <coughs> these cell types, these are CD34 cells, hematopoietic enriched, endothelial enriched, very predictive of outcomes, independent of all other heart failure measurements, including BNP. So in four, 500 plus subjects, 19% died during two and a half year follow-up. And out of those, these cells were independent predictors of mortality. And the VEGF positive population in particular was independently predictive of HEFPEF outcomes. So HEFPEF, remember, is something that we all, is a mysterious condition. God knows what it's due to. Uh, but, uh, but not only is this, in this condition associated with a great reduction in these endothelial progenitor populations, but also that the magnitude of that reduction is uh, highly uh, predictive of future outcomes in this population. So perhaps the etiology of this, we have to rethink as to how this correlates with what's happening to our regenerative capacity. So what about peripheral arterial disease? This <coughs> um, work was done by, uh, analysis was done by uh, Salim. Um, the, um, once again, in peripheral arterial disease compared to those people who only had coronary artery disease. So we had these two populations that were compared, those who had only coronary disease and those who had coronary disease as well as peripheral arterial disease. So people, once they had peripheral arterial disease, happened to have much lower levels of circulating progenitors. But it really didn't matter where this peripheral arterial disease was, whether it was in the carotids, whether it was lower extremity, was aortic, or whether it was in multiple areas. Uh, the reduction was about the same. So lower numbers of hematopoietic and endothelial progenitor cell populations in those who had peripheral arterial disease. And here you're looking at reduction, you know, high or low uh, hematopoietic stems versus um, endothelial, high, low. And notice that if you have high levels of both endothelial and hematopoietic cells, the incidence of PAD was 15%, but almost doubled when, um, when you had low levels of both of those. So the implication of these findings is that once you start running out of the regenerative capacity, if you like, particularly in multiple cell lineages, then you're more likely to get uh, extensive atherosclerosis involving not just one circulation, but multiple circulations. So one of the differences, one of the reasons why risk factors in some people cause just atherosclerosis in one area versus multiple areas, perhaps maybe how this influences a regenerative system. So the more screwed up this is, the more widespread the atherosclerosis 
is going to be. So this is, of course, an implication. These are cross-sectional studies. These are not uh, studies, uh, long-term follow-up studies, which need to be done to really nail these issues. So this paper on heart failure and PAD are published. If you're interested, you can look these up. We also looked um, uh, with Ehab Hajar at cognitive decline and, and progenitor cell levels. This is data from the predictive health cohort, which are otherwise healthy employees of Emory and some from Georgia Tech, who had cognitive function testing done using questionnaires where cognition is tested with um, executive function, working memory, and other domains. And then this was done year after year for four years so that you could see a trend in how this was changing with time. So <clears throat> some of us had a reduction in these domains as we got four years older. Remains to be seen who these people are. But what was found was that the progenitor cell levels were determinants of the cognitive decline, and independently so in this study. Again, this paper is published recently if you wanted to look this up. So, why does it all matter? Well, it's because these cells are predictive of outcomes. So this is a study that I showed early, earlier uh, where we did this in two phases, uh, two cohorts, initial cohort, which we said was discovery, and then we validated this finding in a second cohort of nearly 400 individuals. These are people with stable coronary artery disease that are entering the Emory cardiovascular biobank where we also measured um, everything, including their circulating progenitor cell levels, and they were followed. Uh, for cardiovascular events. And we found that CD34 or 133 dual positive or CXCR4 populations, these were all predictive of outcomes, uh, independently so of death, death and MI, and cardiovascular death. And this is just showing you uh, cell types with, uh, in the pooled cohort and how by a certain cutoff, of these progenitor cell levels. Um, these were independently predictive of outcomes. The C-statistic improved also significantly, suggesting that it did, uh, improved discrimination of risk and was adding to the usual risk factors. In a more recent analysis on a much larger population that uh, Pratik is working with, this is hot off the press, we're looking at individuals it, it, with both lineages of CD34, the so-called um, hematopoietic enriched population as well as the endothelial enriched population. When you have depression in both of these counts, almost two and a half to 3% increased risk compared to people who had high levels of both of these cells. If you had one of these cell lines reduced, then you had intermediate risk. So suggesting that once again, if the, the worse the, um, the regenerative pathway is affected, the higher the risk is in our patients who have coronary artery disease independent of Again, of all the other risk factors, this paper is also available if you wanted to look at. <clears throat> um, so is this just an aging phenomenon? We addressed this earlier with leukocyte telomere length. Um, and, um, and in that same population, uh, we looked at prognosis and the influence of leukocyte telomere length versus our CD34 cell counts. And basically, there's an additive effect. So these are, even though there's a correlation between the two, they are independently predictive of outcomes such that if you were in the lowest quartile, uh, sorry, in the highest quartile of leukocyte telomere length, and you had the highest number of CD34 cells, then your incidence of cardiovascular events was um, four and a half fold lower than if you had low levels of both of these. So you had uh, reduced leukocyte telomere length, you're in the lowest quartile, and you're also in the lowest quartile of your CD34. So both biological aging as well as aging of your regenerative capacity um, accounts for future risk of having adverse outcomes, almost four and a half fold increased risk. So these risk increases, these are all adjusted, and these are far greater than things like smoking and things that we use as, as ways of uh, determining risk. So do we have to go around measuring these, uh, uh, the, do fax analysis and measure these cells, you know, very laborious, expensive technique? Or are there uh, biomarkers that might tell us the same? So one of the biomarkers that we have looked at is uh, SDF1 levels. Remember, this is the ligand for CXCR4, which is a receptor that these stem cells or progenitor cells express that allows them to home. So can we look at C uh, uh, SDF1 levels? This was done by NEMA. Some years ago, uh, in the population, they were followed for outcomes. 
And, and basically what it showed was low level of CXCR uh, of, of SDF1 or CXCL12, same thing, but two different names, um, was highly predictive, uh, such that the difference by this cutoff level was greater than fourfold between those who had high levels and low levels. And as you know, the progenitor cell levels inversely correlate with, um, with SDF1 levels. So this paper was also published a while ago. There's been interest with ceramide levels, which are thought to be also ways in which these uh, stem cells are mobilized from the bone marrow. And I, again, won't go into the biology of this. It's somewhat complicated. But we, uh, in collaboration with this group in Tennessee, we looked at sphingosine 1-phosphate levels and found that there was this very strong relationship between circulating S, uh, uh, S1P levels and CD34. And perhaps this would be another biomarker that might be predictive of outcomes. We know that S, S1P levels have also been shown in other studies to be predictive. And perhaps this is one of the ways in which uh, they manifest that. So summarizing what I've just shown you, approximately 3,000 subjects have been studied to date. Uh, ranging from very healthy young people to very old and very sick people. Circulating progenitor and stem cells can be measured as CD34 subpopulations and consist of both hematopoietic and endothelial enriched populations. There's a decline in these stem cells and progenitor cells with aging that is accelerated in the presence of risk factors or cardiovascular disease. Women compared to men, blacks compared to whites, and thin people compared to obese people have lower levels of circulating progenitor cells. There is a circadian variation in circulating progenitors such that there's higher number in the evening hours and lower numbers in the morning hours when the risk is also highest. There's subclinical vascular diseases associated with lower numbers of progenitor cells. Exercise promotes mobilization of progenitor cells from the bone marrow. When ischemia occurs, it leads to homings of the, homing of the progenitor cells to the ischemic bed and promotes collateralization, presumably, and recovery of function. And infarction mobilizes circulating progenitor cells, at least partly due to VEGF and SDF levels that go up. And then the magnitude of mobilization is predictive of outcomes. If you don't mobilize as well, you have worse outcomes. Patients with heart failure, both HEFPEF and HEFREF, have reduced numbers of circulating progenitors. The magnitude of reduction is associated with the severity of heart failure measured as NYHA class or PA pressures or LA size or BNP. And endothelial progenitor cell populations are particularly predictive of HEFPEF outcomes. Lower progenitor cell levels is associated with worse outcomes in heart failure. And PAD is associated with both reduction in endothelial and hematopoietic progenitors compared to patients with coronary disease. And this lower level, uh, the lower regenerative capacity, uh, the lower it is, the more widespread the atherosclerosis is. Lower levels of progenitor cells is associated with higher mortality in patients with coronary artery disease, in those who have PAD, in those who have heart failure, in those who have acute lung injury, and those who have stroke. I haven't shown you some of this data. Lower progenitor cells are associated with faster cognitive decline, even in healthy people who are employees of Emory. Um, so what do we think is going on? So this is just a cartoon, perhaps to summarize what we think is going on. So at a young age, uh, you're exposed to risk factors. Well, the, the progenitor cell population, or if you like the regenerative capacity in general, we are just measuring this as a biomarker, if you like, um, is able to withstand the injury due to risk factors and cause repair to occur. And there is no development of disease. And while you're doing that, these cells may actually be, um, the levels of these cells may be actually higher because you are actually mobilizing them like you see in during these ischemic injuries states. But as we get older and you've used up some of this reparative capacity and your bone marrow is now not housing as many of these and perhaps the same is occurring in individual tissues, then as you get continued exposure to these risk factors, then your reparative system is defunct, and that's when you start developing disease. So this is perhaps the missing link between um, finding people who have lots of risk factors, but they're age 90 and they're still doing well, and you wonder how the hell they got there without having their heart attack. Well, perhaps this is the difference between these individuals and vice versa. So we've been concentrating on risk factors causing disease. We need to add uh, a measure of regenerative capacity if we are going to be able to more uh, 
uh, accurately personalized risk to individuals. So in order to show you know, that we can improve this, rather than just saying that this is how it is and that's the end of it, uh, the question is how do interventions affect um, progenitor cell levels? So increase in circulating progenitor cell levels has been demonstrated with use of statins, with ACE and ARBs, with diabetes treatments in those who have diabetes, and with exercise as I've shown you. So there's a lot of data along these lines. So even the things that we use generally to lower cholesterol or lower blood pressure and things like that are actually also improving uh, the regenerative or reparative capacity measured in this way. Here's a study that we did using two different kinds of beta blockers where we also measured uh, circulating progenitor cells and showed that in hypertensives, reducing blood pressure with these beta blockers improves uh, these cell counts. In this study in psoriasis patients where we used uh, etanercept, a TNF blocker, they also improved circulating progenitor cell levels. But the real way to show that, the, that these really do matter is by doing cell therapy trials, I guess, where you take people who have disease states or injury states, and you can give these cells back and show that there is improvement. So as you know, um, there have been multiple trials done, including here, um, in ST elevation MI patients, where here in particular, we've been interested in giving CD34 positive cells, and there were a couple of studies done, uh, phase one, phase two trials, with CD34 cell bone marrow aspiration, where we gave it intracoronary post-MI about 10 days later um, by um, intracoronary to the infarct-related artery and looked for improvements, and we found some. Um, they were kind of marginal, but nevertheless, they were reported as positive studies in these trials. There are multiple studies that have been done with heart failure, including here. Most of them have concentrated on mesenchymal stem cells, at least the ones that we have done here. And, and these are some of the publications as a result of those. Currently, we are still uh, doing, um, we're still recruiting for a study using mesenchymal stem cells, off-the-shelf stem cells, um, in uh, people with HEFREF of any etiology. So if you have such patients, please uh, refer them to us. And the third uh, area that we have had a lot of interest is in peripheral arterial disease, particularly in patients with claudication, where we've used this strategy of mobilizing bone marrow progenitors using GMCSF and did a phase one and a phase two trial that have been published. And, and in this phase two trial, we found that GMCSF given uh, three times a week for four weeks lead to, leads to increase in white cell count, increase in progenitor cell counts, and also improvement in walking time in people who are claudicating. So the change in peak walking time was a little better in the treated population compared to those who were given placebo. So as a result of this, we have now been funded for a phase three of this study, or phase 2B of this study called GPAT-3 study, where we are recruiting 150 subjects with intermittent claudication who will be randomized two to one to give GMCSF versus placebo. But this will be given twice, once at baseline, and then once again at three months. So as to see whether the improvement that we saw in the phase two study could be better seen or uh, increased the level of improvement by repeat administration of GMCSF after three months. So we're looking for a recruitment of this, and Pratik there has little cards for you as a reminder for you for inclusion and exclusion, but it, you don't really need to do anything. We're just looking for people who have claudication, um, and we can take the rest from there uh, if you can just call and refer this patient. If everybody in this room and who's listening refers one patient every six months, we'll be done. Thank you very much in advance. So um, I have to acknowledge a number of people who work on this, our fellows, cat lab attendings and staff who help uh, us collect these samples, uh, people who run the lab, our coordinators, biobank staff, and our colleagues in various departments, um, including the progenitor cell lab, um, uh, which is uh, supervised by Ned Waller, without whose help we would not have done any of this work and the many funding agencies that help carry this out. Thank you very much for your attention. That was fantastic, Arsh, had a real tour de force. So um, <clears throat> I guess a, a couple of questions. One, just to talk a little bit more about the different cell types used in the cell-based therapy. 
um, you know, and how they relate to the biomarker cells that you're measuring. Because some of those are mesenchymal stem cells, some of those are, are these more differentiated, potentially endothelial progenitors. Um, just could talk a little bit more about that and that relationship. So uh, amongst the categories of cell types that have been used for cell therapy, there have been the so-called endothelial enriched populations. These are either bone marrow mononuclear cells which have, have just been given as such without any uh, selection, or uh, CD34 cells that have been multiple trials using that, including the ones that I referred to here. And, and in these trials, if you look at sub-analyses where they have measured the numbers of these cells, uh, either in the bone marrow and the effect that these individuals had, there seems to be a correlation such that, and even in our GMCSF studies where we looked at mobilization of these studies and the improvement, such that people who had better mobilization or have more of these cells within their bone marrow, they tended to have more of an improvement in their function. So that's the relationship, if you like, between um, what's happening there if you're using autologous therapy, meaning you're using the patient's own cells for this therapy and you're somehow extracting them and giving them, then the, uh, the capacity of these cells to be regenerative, measured in a variety of different assays, uh, appears to be correlating with uh, the level of improvement that's seen. So without taking all of that into account and just giving it to everybody, it might lead to the kind of a result that we see which is usually either negative or slightly positive and nobody really believes it works because we really need to hone in to where and in whom it's going to help using autologous therapy. The mesenchymal stem cell approach has taken two uh, approaches. One is using individuals' own MSCs and, um, and then uh, the, this uh, allogeneic approach where you get off the shelf MSCs from uh, a young donor, usually uh, cultured in a certain way that makes them more ja um, jazzed up, if you like, they're much more angiogenic. Um, so the, the argument is that the, uh, these allogeneic MSCs coming from a young donor are going to be much more angiogenic than this old person with lots of disease, so they already have a incapacitated regenerative capacity, then you're using their MSCs to do something and they may not be as effective. The counter argument to that is these are likely to be more likely to be rejected, whereas those are not, although there's very little rejection going on somehow with MSCs than you would expect. So this is all up in the air. This is all, studies are still going on. In these circulating levels that we measure, we actually don't measure MSC levels because they are very infrequent. So the accuracy with which one can measure these cells beyond the ones that we are measuring becomes more and more problematic to, to use that as a biomarker. Other questions? You have to use the microphone. Thank you so much. Um, I, was, I thought it was curious that obesity increases EPCs, and I assume that diabetes decreases EPCs. When you get old. So if you're a young diabetic, okay, because. I would have expected that obesity would have caused the decrease. Yeah, there is not a one-to-one -one relationship. You know, there's always this heterogeneity with any risk factor and what we find with these cells. The old days, people did 15 people and said, okay, these diabetics are lower and these are normal. I mean, when you do these thousands of individuals, you see there's this huge heterogeneity. And I think the answer is in what I was showing you earlier. It is to do with age. So if, you, if you've got risk factors and you're young, you, you may not have abnormal levels of these cells because you're using them up. It's when you get old and, um, and then have diabetes, that's when you see that you are much lower, end up much lower than the others. So it all depends on the duration and how it's affecting your system, et cetera, et cetera. But it is interesting that obesity is actually associated with increase in number of these cells. And maybe this explains some of this obesity paradox that we see that when we have cardiovascular disease, obese individuals actually do better than the thin ones. I used to think this was all about cigarettes, but actually it's probably more than that. So Arshad, in the, um, in the older population, is the decrease related to decreased production or are they being used more, do you know? It's hard to know because we haven't followed people for 90 years. You know? So these are all cross-sectional. Whatever I've shown you is all cross-sectional. So whatever I, we I guess what I meant to ask, related to the uh, related to risk factors. 
But this can be recapitulated in animal experimental models, which I didn't show you. But there is good data to suggest that if you are exposed to risk factors, and the animal's life is like you know six months or whatever, depending on which model you're using, the, um, you run out, the bone marrow runs out. And as you saw in the acute MI oldish population that we, where we harvested their bone marrow and we looked at their peripheral cells, there was this neat relationship. We never see our values that high ever. Um, so that really is what we see in the periphery is reflecting what's in the bone marrow. So it's not the inability to mobilize and this and that, which was hypothesized a while ago. I think you just have run out of them, at least in the bone marrow. And presumably the same thing is happening in the tissues. Um, I mean, I think this HEF-PEF story is big. And, I think we just need to delve into that a bit more. Have you looked at heart rate? Is a high heart rate bad? Heart rate? Yeah. Because there's, there's some data that patients with higher heart rates don't develop coronary collaterals. It but. can be done by this afternoon. Okay. <laughs> yeah, along the lines of what Pooja mentioned, um, the, ob the obesity story, um, I mean, to tease that out a little bit more, so obese with or without metabolic syndrome, obese with or without diabetes, and, and I do think that whole obesity paradox, uh, you know, is, is a really uh, interesting uh, question that's really unresolved. Um, and then you mentioned the, the relationship with many, uh, I guess, interventions. Anybody look at dietary patterns that you're aware of? And... Um, impact on progenitor cells? So Frank is standing there. He looked at um, uh, android versus gynoid fat distribution and these cells and vascular function and oxidative stress, et cetera. But what was found was that this correlation was strongest with android, you know, so sort of central obesity for what it's worth. Uh, so I think um, it's a sort of a pro-inflammatory state, and if you, you know, it's like microvascular angina population. If you have a little bit of something going on, you're going to mobilize these cells. And, and, and the interesting thing will be to look at 80-year-olds with obesity, which actually we can't find, um, and see how much they've run out. It would be the hypothesis, but we just don't have enough of that population. Uh, <clears throat> uh, diets. We did a study with Mediterranean diet, remember, years ago, <clears throat> where people were given Mediterranean diet for a couple of months from the GCRC. In the days, GCRC did this kind of stuff. Um, they still do for a <laughs> not, for, not for free. Um, so, yes. Um, so the, uh, what we found there was we were using colony-forming unit assay, you know, which is very complicated. It actually shows more units when you're more inflamed. We actually saw a reduction in this uh, after a Mediterranean-style diet, suggesting that uh, this sort of um, in the young population where, you, where obesity, et cetera, metabolic, they all had metabolic syndrome. When you, uh, when you get this activated, when you... Um, increased levels, you can actually passivate that increase by changing the diet. But it really needs to be redone by the modern techniques. So Arshad, so the, the, the idea of the repair component uh, is one that I've heard you talk about for a little while, and obviously it was fantastic work. The, the question is, is both uh, in terms of interrogating it with biomarkers, as you suggested with some of the work, and then also potentially targeting these biomarkers uh, with therapies, um, you know, where are we with that in terms of making the clinical transition um, with interrogation with biomarkers and, and then these specific therapies? Um, obviously, we're particularly interested in the acute MI uh, situation that you described with this prognostic implications of having the repair, uh, these patients are self-declared being high risk because they presented with acute MI. So sometimes it's really hard to further stratify them. That seems like a great opportunity. Um, so I, I guess my question is, is, you know, how far are we from transitioning some of this to clinical tools that we can use? Um, and I know you're working on the therapy front. 
you can't order it today and get a level. Uh, that's the problem. Um, it, it's true of any biomarker stuff. And um, so it's a, it's a whole different story. I can give a talk on the, how one can get biomarkers into clinical use. Um, somebody has got to make money doing this. And um, the uh, Supreme Court uh, decision was that you cannot patent biomarkers and sell them as an assay. And that has impeded biomarker use in medicine. Short answer to your question. So until that gets resolved and somehow one can do this in a way where um, you can actually do this in a, in a way where it, you know, it can be marketed, it, it's not gonna happen. One last quick one. Question is, how about looking at the frailty? Has anybody tried to differentiate the frailty group from just the elderly group and see the relationship? We haven't done that. That was one of our proposals, but it has <laughs> hasn't been done. And and I think it'll be a great thing, a great thing to study. Um, and perhaps you know, even in our population that we recruit, there are a lot of older people. Um, having a good scale of frailty administered would, would actually give us that data in a cross-sectional manner. Uh, but we haven't done that. Perhaps we can work on that. Right. I think we have to uh, call it quits there. We'll have some questions afterwards. But thanks for the proceeding program is copyrighted by Emory University.